You, you know, it's your concert, so you're sort of welcoming pe people to your house, you know, in some ways. And again, it's just like a, it's your personal um, relationship with the piece. I, I think for also some pieces that are unknown, I, I think it just opens up a lot of doors. I know for me, um, when pianists have played pieces I didn't know, but when they've told me how they feel about it or they just showed me a couple little things about it, it really just helped me to listen to it. Hi, and welcome to And If Love Remains. I'm your host, Mike Levitt, and we are again co-hosted with Dr. Elias Axel Pedersen, our music maestro of <laughs> And If Love Remains. <laughs> Say hello, Elias. Hey, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have you on board again. And we have um, uh, Dr. Tom Rosencrantz today, and I am excited to have him. We had him on before, um, and you know, I just, I, Thank you for coming on the show again, Tom. I really appreciate it. And, and I'm excited to, to chat with you about, you know, whatever comes up. It's going to be good stuff. Yeah, thanks. Again. Well, it's, it's honestly, it's really my pleasure. I had such a great time last time with talking with you guys. And I, I'm just excited to be chatting with you, you all again. So thank you for inviting me again. I appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's, it's really our pleasure. This, and and um, it's funny, you know, I was, I was, um, talking to uh, Elias a little bit and, and, and we were discussing before the, the program. And one of the things I think I, one of the reasons I started this podcast, um, let me put it this way, um, was because I wanted a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds um, to, and, and including myself, I'll, I'm going to put myself in the same category to enjoy great art and great, greatness in all its forms. Let me put it that way, because it could be science, it could be literature, it could be, you know, uh, math. I mean, I'm not really particular, but I think it's important for people to recognize and know what makes great art and and why, why, why certain things stand the test of time, why certain performances stand, stand the test of time. And that's one of the reasons I really wanted to start this podcast is to give people a reason to go through the effort of of um of knowing that knowing how to appreciate that art mm -hmm. yeah and discovering and, it yeah you know i'm, I'm yeah yeah discovering it and 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 you know maybe finding a passion for it and and um you know tom i i know that that you know especially as a as a as a teacher a mentor and as a as a performer you know uh, you know you're you're engaged in, in helping people to to kind of go through that process whether it's as a as a student or as a you know, as an audience, you know, uh, talk to me a little bit about that. Like, how do you, when you're, when you're in front of an audience or when you're, you know, um, preparing for a performance, like how, how do you engage with the audience or how do you engage with the student? And I know that's kind of a complex sure. question, but yeah. I'm going to keep it open there. Yeah. Maybe I can start with a con the idea of a concert because I'll be finally playing live for the first time next week. So I'm excited oh, and nervous because you know, COVID happened and I haven't seen a live audience for a long time. So I'm excited, but here's what I want to do, you know, and for me, this is, these are the kind of concerts I want to go to. First of all, what I don't like is the kind of formality of classical music, which is, you know, the pianist sort of walks out there, barely bows and then just dives in. I'm really not interested in that. I'm interested for the pianist or whoever to, to talk to me a little bit about the context of the music, you know? And so if you, and that's a very simple thing to do, but actually it just breaks this wall of this, this classical wall of like, um, you know, the sense that the performer cannot be touched and that the, the audience is there listening quietly while the performer is in meditation with the gods. You know, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not buying that kind of That's thing awesome. anymore. So I think first thing is give a context to the audience. So like, for instance, next week I'm going to play this long sonata by Charles Ives called the Concord Sonata. Oh, you're playing. And wow. What's, what's awesome about that piece is that there's a context from these transcendentalist writers, Emerson, Hawthorne, and Thoreau. And Ives was obsessed with these writers. And each movement 
um, deals with them. And so if I'm going to, my job is to try to talk to them about, you know, what are some things to listen to? How does Ives, um, you know, use it? And what does that mean? Like, how does he spiritually use it? You know, now not to give them like a lecture, you know, but just right. a few words and some things for them to, to realize. And the other thing about that piece, which I think is magical is like, he quotes Beethoven, he quotes, you know, Scottish folk hymns, he's Chopin. quoting Wagner. And so it's kind of like this reservoir of like all this music. And I, I just want people to, to realize that it's also filled with jokes. So, I mean, if someone started laughing in the middle of Hawthorne, I think that would be fine because it actually is like pretty funny, you know, some of the moments, you know? So like, I think for, for to answer your question for performance, for performances, I think it's, it's great to break that wall in any way that you can. For yeah. students, I mean, I, I think it's the, the same kind of thing is that they need to know that this old guard of like, you know, the, the pianist is sort of in this ivory tower that needs to change. So they need to get used to speaking about their pieces. And what that means is that they actually need to have a point of view. So it's not just like they have to have a personal point of view, I should say. And um, that takes some real personal investigating. So that's, uh, you know, for a lot of students, that's a difficult thing. That's difficult for everyone, you know, but I, I think yeah. that's the kind of thing which I feel is important. Oh, that's that's great. I think it, it's interesting. I, real quick, Elias, I, I wanted to mention because I wanted to mention you. One of the we I just um, had some of my students participate in a master class with with Elias, and oh. it was a wonderful experience, and it was great. And one of the things I appreciate about what Elias did is he he went with each of my students and, and asked him about the piece itself, and asked him like, what is it? What is it? What you know? What do you know about it? And they didn't know because I hadn't taught them a lot of that stuff, and it was really I think impressive on them that that they should know the piece and it impressed on me that i should help them learn this that stuff yeah and help yeah. them appreciate what what they're doing so that was you know i want to give credit to Elias for doing that and i think that's a mm -hmm. wise thing if we just educate just a little bit you know or, or tell a story to engage people yeah give yeah. a context give yeah. a context. yeah yeah Th mm -hmm. thanks i was thinking about that and and i think uh it's hard when the kids are younger i mean it's not just <clears throat> it's not just your students when i was a student I also didn't study as much as I could have. Uh, I didn't read. I didn't have all the con the historical context, which I did obviously in college and in my master's. Um, but I think it's important to inculcate that from a young age. And okay, this is not this is not a piece that's just set apart from everything else. It it uh, it's within a culture, within you know art of the time. You know when you play when I I remember when I played mm -hmm. Debussy as a kid. I um, I looked at impressionist paintings, and I love to go to museums anyhow. Um, but that that does inform how you might play the piece, uh, good or bad. It just yeah. gives you some reference. Uh, I was going to ask on uh, one of the things you mentioned, Tom, about you know getting away from this ivory tower kind of feeling and breaking that fourth wall like an actor might. Um, mm -hmm. I know a lot of people are averse to speaking. It's just not something that's really trained, especially at the conservatory level it's uh, you're trained how to play piano or how to play your instrument and how to perfect that but not mm -hmm. how to communicate um, what those feelings might mean to you in words uh, and so that's mm. that's one thing is how do we how do we shift that balance or change that teaching uh, is it maybe it's just getting rid of some of the old guard but retaining some of the good parts of it and the other thing I was going to ask is are there locations or are there times and places where that's that's uh, more effective or maybe not appreciative uh, appreciated. Like, you know, I, I haven't ever performed a solo recital in Carnegie hall, but I imagine if I did, uh, would the audience want me to give a lecture recital or talk or I, I don't know. There are a lot of questions I'd have about that. So I don't know if you can talk to that's some right. Of those. Yeah. Well, it's again, it's the context. Yeah. So, I mean, the thing about this Ives piece, I'm, I'm going, I mean, that's on my mind because that's what I'm going to play next week. But I mean, that piece, uh, it's 100 years old, and yet it's still not played a lot. It's talked a lot about, <laughs> but it's not played a lot. You know, I mean, most people um, that's hard. learn about it. <laughs> it's very hard. Yeah, I mean, it's also, it's also hard, but, um, you know, it's 100 years old now, and it, it just had its birthday last year as, as far yeah. as its premiere. But um, so... 
I, I think because it's kind of a piece that isn't played a lot, I think it, it just needs to give a context. You know, it just it reminds me, if I could just say a quick story about that. You know, I think a lot of people imagine that people are just always scared of all contemporary music. All like audiences are just always scared. But the thing is, if they if you tell them why you love it or why, you know, what context, what even what personal context it has for you, really that opens a door for the audience to understand you and your connection and by way of that, they're going to hopefully have a window in the piece, you know. And so I, I just think um, that's really important. But you also bring up a really good point that, like, what's the other context? I mean, like, here, here's another context. So this Ives um, piece, you know, in October, there's going to be an Ives symposium here at UMKC. So all these Ives scholars are going to come. And we're going to, you know, sort of celebrate the Concord Sonata. So in that context, I don't need to educate. I don't need to, like, tell yeah. them. I mean, I could tell them some personal things about sure. my relationship, but I don't need to go in because they've written books. They know much more about the piece <laughs> than I do. You know what I mean? So you're right. I think the context really matters, you know. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's important. I, um, yeah, go ahead, Mike. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, I think, um, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, the, one of the things I love about what you're bringing to the table here, Tom, is, is the idea of kind of like a, um, evangelical energy almost of, as far as, as, you know, I, I you mentioned, you know, the piano, just the, the pianist just coming up, sitting down and just playing, you know, getting right into it. And, and, you know, there is something to like having the audience know even that you just love the piece that you just like how much you, like you said, you have a personal appreciation and you love the piano and you think it's a, you know, a, an instrument and a, a, um, an art form that, that needs to be, you know, shared with everybody. And I, and sometimes I feel like, um, especially in the, in the classical world, that kind of exuberance, that evangelical exuberance is, can be lost. Yeah. I mean, you know, and then someone, you know, I heard um, Stephen Huff talk about this whole thing um, about for him. It's different for everyone. For him, he really loves the res and respects the idea, you know, four minutes before um, 8 p.m. It's a hushed audience. The pianist comes on the stage, takes a bow. The lights are dimmed. He plays the piece, doesn't say anything. So for him, that feels right. You know, there's, he likes this sort of traditional thing. And I, of course, respect that idea. But it's just personal. For me, it just seems like, um, you, you know, it's your concert. So you're sort of welcoming pe people to your house, you know, in some ways. And again, it's just like a, it's your personal um, relationship with the piece. I, I think for also some pieces that are unknown, I, I think it just opens up a lot of doors. I know for me, um, when pianists have played pieces I didn't know, but when they've told me how they feel about it or they just showed me a couple little things about it, it really just helped me to listen to it, you know? What, what are some other things, like, especially if you're, you're trying to play some newer pieces, you know, everybody's heard, you know, the, the Beethoven sonatas and so much other of the old music, and, and it, it's, the, that stuff is a really important part of the repertoire. But but you also need to like like it is pretty amazing that that, that piece is a hundred years old and is still as obscure as it is. Um, how you know how can you um, or how can we as as artists you know bring this out and and kind of make it more accessible? And I think you mentioned a couple of ways, but but you know maybe speak to that just making it more accessible to the general audience or or people you know people in general. Well, it's you know it just it kind of it's mind boggling, and you guys know this about this already. But like the piano literature is so it's so immense, and what happens is only about you know ten percent of it is what is highlighted. So like the, um, ten or maybe fifteen percent is what tends to get played. We call that the standard repertoire. But here's the thing: everyone is so different. I mean, us three people talking to each other, we're all so different. We all come from different backgrounds, et cetera, et cetera. So it makes sense that we have to, we have to be willing to find repertoire that speaks to us. The problem is that a lot of people, because it's, you know, it's like 
um, it's kind of mining for gold. You know, you, you spend all that time in the water in the 1800s trying to find gold, and you may not find gold. But you, so you just have to be willing to find, try to find pieces that um, speak to you. And that just takes time, and you got to really be uh, truthful about yourself. You know, what is it that you want to, what do you want to play? Like, what makes you, you? And what piece might bring more of you out? If that makes sense, yeah. You know, and so like, um, you have to be willing to dig, and um, that is, you know, th I think that is um, sometimes not easy to do because some of this, these pieces, like m maybe people don't get it, but that's okay. It would be yeah. the same thing. Like recently, I um, I decided to compose something, and I feel very self conscious about composing because I'm. I'm not trained as a composer, but I thought, you know, I, I want to do this and um, I'll, I'll just, I'll make a recording of it and, it, you know, I'll share it with some people and that'll be fine. But the point is that it's just, you know, that composition that I made, I just wanted to express something from myself and there wasn't, so, and I just felt like I needed to create something. So in some ways, if you think about repertoire that way, it's just a way to express yourself and if you're willing to dig in, and mine for gold, um, you might find something that speaks to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think what you're saying too, I, it's very important for students of all levels. And I, I'm guessing you really uh, practice what you, what you preach in your teaching as well, that, that students, of course, they have to play maybe certain standard rep, but even within that rep, they can find their own voice um, and find a personal way of saying it. But also, you know, experiment and, and push your own boundaries, find something that's new. And, and it doesn't have to be new just for the sake of being new. It can still speak to you in some way. Um, and it's hard to find that yeah, kind of repertoire. Right. And I think I, for me, I've kind of looked on the fringes of, you said that 10 or 15% that makes our our standard rep. And maybe looking at that that 16 to 20% that's played a bit, but not so often. And I, and I would put the Ives and maybe like the 20 to 40% range. Uh, it's just not played or even right. less than that. But, you know, you, you play a repertoire where you're giving world premieres and nobody's heard it. And you're, you're needing, needing to uh, present something that's, that's totally maybe not even accessible to, to most people um, and still needing to convince them about it. Uh, so I, I'm curious, yeah. how do you choose those things? Are, are there pieces that you've played that are contemporary works where, Maybe you're not even sold on them at the beginning, but you grow to to love them as you work on them. Yeah, sure. You know, sometimes um, composers may they write me a piece, and um, and I, I'm really flattered that they would do that. And then, and then I'm I have to learn it, you know, for mm -hmm. a festival or something. And half like it's it's my duty, you know, and it's something that I really want to do well because they wrote it in a loving way and you know in a, a really diligent way so it's my duty to kind of do the best i can but in some ways those first performances i feel there's more of an obligation because it's like giving birth to a small child and you got to make sure that the first couple weeks that they're fine that they're healthy so i find mm -hmm. i find like if I, I i put a little bit more pressure on myself for premieres because I want people to take the piece on, you know? Yeah. And I, I mean, I hope that they would because they think it's a good piece. And, um, you know, um, I think that's really noble. And someone like so humble, like uh, Ur Ursula Oppens, who is uh -huh. a, a pianist who has played, you know, so many Hundreds premieres of, yeah. and uh, someone I admire very much. She is so humble. She is, you know, sort of sees that as her job to do, of course, great first performances, but she believes that future generations will play it better than her. And mm. so she feels like um, that's sort of, she's handing off the piece to the next generation, if that makes sense. And so mm. it's her duty to kind of do the best job she can, you know? And so I, I love that idea. I think that's really wonderful, you know? Yeah, that's a that cool thought. Wonderful. How, how um, difficult is it when you're, I mean, you have nothing to go, I mean, you have the score and you probably have some communication with the composer. Um, but, but to, to learn a piece, you know, without any real reference, um, you know, that's, that's kind of, 
unheard of, <laughs> you know, unless it obviously unless it is a premiere. You know, how difficult is that to do? I think it's it's actually quite fun. I mean, it is it's difficult, but you always like no composer composes in a vacuum. So even like someone like John Cage, he um, he he's going he's like he's going against things. So he's like um, one can say he's like you know opposed to all of these previous ideas. But every other composer I can think about is like there's a reference in some ways to other composers. So like if you're interpreting that, you're using that. You know, little maybe it's um, you know hodgepodge. It's a little bit here, a little bit there, um, and so you know, for me, it's like traveling to a strange country, because a lot of times I have to, you know, maybe maybe I have to improvise, or maybe I have to like, I have to phrase in a different way that I normally wouldn't, and because the composer is trying to go for a different thing, or or vice versa. And I actually love that challenge because it's. Um, but to be honest, it takes me, when I have those new pieces, of course, I'm very skeptical in the beginning because, <laughs> you know, yeah. like it's hard to hear, it's hard to really understand the whole piece. But mm -hmm. as you work on it, um, just like anything, you digest it and it, it becomes a whole. And you sort of trust that the composer is going to, is thoughtful and has done something where he or she has really thought about it. And so in the end result, I, I think it's always a pleasurable thing. And it's always so meaningful to play for composers because um, we need each other. I mean, yeah. we, we need this back and forth. And it just keeps this healthy kind of relationship. You know, instead of, uh, I mean, of course we respect the composer, but don't ever think of the composer as a demigod where you, don't touch them or you put them in like a, a glass Incalibre. container and you, yeah, right. And you, you put it away and you don't ever actually, you know, like that's, that's another problem, which I think we were talking about last time. We tend to uh, interpret composers like that. We love them, but like if you love them too much, you, you put them in this, in this glass case and you mm -hmm. never get to play with them, which is bad. <laughs> right. Yeah. That's yeah. So you got right it. On. Yeah. Got to take the violin out of the case and play it once in a while to enjoy it. Yes, exactly. So, Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, that's that's cool. I, I love your outlook and take on tackling these new projects because I just know that most pianists, uh, I would say, you know, in, in going to the professional sphere or even uh, students, just don't have the desire or the wherewithal to, to tackle so many. Um, I know you play a lot of new music and and I mean every all music. Uh, and for myself, you know, I, I don't call myself a, uh, a new music specialist by any means. I've championed a few, few things here or there and each one it's, uh, it's tough. It's a lot of work yeah. to start out. You don't have any recordings as references as Mike was kind of alluding yeah. to, and, and nobody else has played it. And, um, you hope you're getting it sort of right, or at least what yeah. you said, Ursula Oppens is doing, giving a groundwork for the future generations, which I love. That really is that is powerful to have that humble outlook because yeah. it, 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 is. It, 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 it doesn't necessarily take the pressure off, but it definitely yeah. says I'm going to be the standard and, you know, here, take it now from here. Yeah. Give yeah. It yeah. So it's a great, it's, it's a very it's a, healthy attitude that you guys have. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's wonderful. Yeah. It just depends on, you know, your comfort zone, like, um, you, right. you know, and you also have to be willing to, you may only play that piece one time. And, <clears> and so what does that mean? I mean, cause it may be a bad piece and that, and mm -hmm. that's okay because, but the thing is for the composer to get better, the composer needs to hear you perform that piece because then, you know, and you worked on it and the composer learned some things, hopefully with, um, you know, this, and then the next time the, the composer is going to write a better piece because they, he or she learned from that. Like, okay, yeah. that worked. Okay. That didn't work. That's okay. So that's right actually on. unplayable. Yeah, so, yeah. You know, it actually, it actually doesn't work with a human hand. You know, yeah. just very basic things like that. But I mean, it's um, so you know, you have to be willing to just say like this may just be a one-off. Mm -hmm. But um, then it goes back to the other thing is that you have to love the process. You have mm -hmm. to be willing to like, you know. I mean, if you think about one piece, like one new piece, maybe I practice that for 30, 40 hours, maybe more. You know, mm -hmm. could yeah. be more, and then I perform it for five minutes, yeah. and then that's it. 
Right. Think about that for a second. Wow. <laughs> so, um, of course, I'd like to play it again, but there may not be another opportunity, right? Because this piece yeah. is so obscure. But so I need to enjoy this process because it's not so much about. I mean, there's a wonderful metaphor for this. If you, if I could just say it quickly, I don't want to sure. ramble on too much. Too much, but in um, on the on the island of Maui, there's a um, there's a there's a road that people go on called the road to Hana, mm. and it's the 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 actual payoff is this um, this little town called Hana, but actually that's not the payoff. It's actually the road to Hana. So mm. like even though you're going to Hana. Um, this town, it's really the scenic, you know, road. You see these beautiful cliffs, these beautiful things, and it's getting there, which actually really matters. Because once you get to Hana, it's just like big deal. There's nothing here. Yeah. I, why, you <laughs> know, and, and so for me, it's kind of like what, in some ways, what it's about. It's more about the process and the road to something is more meaningful or you got to find meaning in that because if not, it's not going to be, it may not uh, pay off yeah, yeah. Uh, that one performance. Yeah. yeah. It's not the ends well, justifying that, the means. That, it's the means justifying the end almost. Yeah, I uh, think so. Kind of. I yeah. Think so. That's interesting. Um, the, the turn around and take the road back from Hana a little oh. bit. How does, how does when you play a, a new piece or, or even the, like what the piece you prefer for right now, um, how does that affect when you when you do um, go back in kind of the standard repertoire? How does that affect um, how you approach those pieces? And 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 does it? Um, I mean, yeah, yeah I just it's a keep big, that open. How does that affect huge, it? Yeah, it's a huge. Um, should I say dialogue? So I mean, for each piece, whatever it is, if it's like Bach or Ives or whoever, or like a new piece, you know, it's just a. I mean it all comes down to like, what are you trying to communicate with this piece? And so like, and, and how, and by what means are you trying to communicate that, you know? And so um, with Ives, it's a little bit more, I mean, it just is all over the map. He's like, it's really kaleidoscopic with what he's trying to do. And so somehow like one of my goals is to try to organize it in some way, although the music unfolds and, Kind of stream of consciousness. My my job is to try to make sense of it for me in a right. deep way, so that I can try my hardest to communicate that to the audience. I might fail. I mean, I probably will fail at that, but that's what I'm trying to do every single time I practice, and every time it's just chiseling away. And then you know, it, I'm also trying to learn the Goldberg variations again, and I'm struggling with that piece. But when I you know ever when I switch from like Ives to Bach. It's interesting. They share a lot of this very intense communication. You know, they really are trying to, I mean, both those pieces are such strong pieces, and they're both these mammoth um, kind of essays and sound, you know. And so it just, it comes down to that. Like, so, I mean, of course, Bach is doing his thing in a different period, but he's still trying to communicate these with these little variations, these different kinds of emotional states. As of as his Ives, he has four movements. I mean, you know, Bach has 30, 30 variations, twenty nine variations, thirty variations. Um, so he, you know, each one is like its own little world. So it's also in its own little way, um, you know, hard to think about that because each one is its own, you know, identity. I think with Ives, it's like it's, you have more time because each each movement is like fifteen minutes, that kind yeah. of thing. So, but um, okay. They both talk to each other in weird ways. <laughs> I'll just put that it is really interesting. And it is, it seems like such an interesting dialogue and it's a dialogue through the centuries. Uh, mm -hmm. we, we were talking to uh, Mark Ainley last, uh, last time and even, even with uh, Tom earlier. And, and we were, we were, we were talking about how, um, you know, maybe the styles are different, you know, from when people played in the fifties and stuff, but you can tell what a great artist is and you can tell, you know, that that is a great artist because of, of you know different um, uh, um, attributes that that they that they may possess or, or may have, um, yeah. and and I think it's the same thing with composers like this this constant dialogue between artist and and composer and how we can fit 
I, you know, how, how can we fit Bach into our time today in this postmodern crazy world? Somehow he still fits and because his, his art still speaks to us. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, sure. It does. Yeah. I mean, we've been, we've been reinterpreting him. You know, I, I think yeah. um, we've been reconsidering him and somehow his, his music is still valid because there's still, it's still evolving. It hasn't stopped changing. And that's, um, I, there's other factors, of course, but that's why we still have these composers around. And then, you know, if you look at, for instance, if you look like a hundred years ago, what composers were were in vogue, they're totally different. Yeah. You know, it's like, yeah. um, and so things like society picks the kind of stuff that's meaningful for them. And then sometimes they'll throw it away in 10 years. And that's also, sometimes it's financial. Sometimes it's like some musicologists really thought this composer special and they hyped him up. Who knows? But um, mm-hmm. that's a whole, that's a thing too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting in, in teaching that uh, you have to obviously bring the music alive. And I remember always struggling with Bach. I mean, it's the farthest away in terms of, time periods from from our day but uh i always told my students when we studied the different eras you know you have baroque and classical romantic those are the large eras that when bach was writing his music he didn't think oh i'm going to write some baroque music uh you know maybe he had yeah, some sure. aesthetics of the time but of course he was a human and he was uh, a very i mean he had 20 kids he was certainly an active human and was in, in the community and he was an organist and you know loved by so many um, and had your the challenges of everyday life that we have. Um, yeah. So when he yeah, was writing music, right. he was putting his heart and soul into it, just with with different tools. And to say that somehow that's not very romantic music. Um, well, I mean, it can be very sentimental and romantic, and have a lot of heartfelt uh, things in it. And you can get romantic composers oh, yeah. from that era who are very cold sometimes. So. I don't know. Of course, the styles are different, but I just I try to impose or, or uh, encourage my students or convince them that that every composer had some romantic side to them. Something yeah, like that. Uh, no, it's it, what you said is so true. And what I admire about Bach um, is that he seemed to um, create create music that was for use. And by that, I mean, like, you know, he was constantly writing something for church. You know, mm-hmm. every Sunday he had to come up with a new thing and he was constantly doing this and it was for use. And mm-hmm. that may seem obvious, but I think a lot of times we don't we don't see it that way. You know, mm-hmm. um, this was prevalent like hundreds of years ago before radios and, and so forth. When people would go home at night, they would play through things in their lo- on their piano, you know, and they oh, yeah. would try out songs and they would do f- have sort of family time. And that was sort of their entertainment. It was for use. Even yeah. if you're an amateur, it didn't matter because you love the sound of it. And I, I feel like Bach was, uh, there's something to that. Um, and um, mm-hmm. uh, there... There is something, is, of course, it's emotional, but it's like something you can use if that makes sense. Yeah, more more utilitarian and not too as just not only esoteric. Yeah, sure. I guess. Yeah. 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 That, yeah. Anyway, that, cool. That, that pure music that you know that. Um, anyway, yeah, that's that's really interesting. I think. Uh, um, I forgot my train of thought. So we used to have- <laughs> yeah. no. I, I I mean we can go off on on so many tangents. Um, uh, and I love the fact that you're playing Bach very soon and Ives. I mean, those are, in a way, so far apart, and yet they have so many, so many things in common. I guess. Um, but I, I was going to ask, maybe just onto the current state of pianism, piano performance. Uh, of course, after this pandemic is kind of tricky. But you mentioned you're going back to your first recital in a long time. And last time you were here, we talked about the state of conservatories. I wonder if you could illuminate some of your thoughts or if they've changed after uh, after this pandemic on uh, on where you see live music going and and the importance of performance uh, just some of these big topics I'd mm. love to to open up the open up the discussion to something on on those lines. So. Yeah. Well, it's boy, it's such an interesting thing. Um I I think what what I'm excited about is that people feel more comfortable 
about this online presence now, whether we like it or not. We all learned it and we all kind of feel more comfortable. And companies, not so much music, but you know, companies are going to rethink the idea of the office place now, right? And there's going to be a, maybe more flexibility with that. And so I think what that means is that, I mean, things are going to come back to person, in person, but I think there's always going to be this other halo of online activity. And how that, how that interacts and plays out with live things, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but That could be exciting. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be a an, 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 an really interesting thing. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm excited about being uh, in a group again with people, you know. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I think that's um, – it's going to be euphoric again for, uh, for people to be kind of, you know, put together in these groups. Um, education, I think, is going to have a lot of problems because – we, like I was mentioning, we all feel more comfortable with this online presence. And the, old, the thing with a university is it's one of the things that is really special about it is that it's a community, you know? Mm -hmm. So the community is something that is that I think you really should never lose because community is what how, also how you learn. It's not just learning through your teachers and so forth. Yeah. But what it means is that if the technology gets better down the way, there may be a, a real possibility for online um, teaching to become a kind of normal thing. Or it could be three, you know, three online lessons a month and one live. I don't know. But right mm -hmm. now the technology still is it's improving, but it still has a lot of clunky features. Um, I just I just wonder if Apple or you know Google if they were able to like invest a lot of money in that and also in the educational sector that would really turn education on its head and that would also force these high tuition places to like rethink that you know mm -hmm. um, so I don't you know I don't really have a, I'm just optimistic that I'm optimistic that something drastically will change. Um, and I think it will benefit students because it will mean that um, there'll be less tuition dollars to pay, I think, because there will be less resources to suck in, you know. Um, and so I think, I think that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, I, yeah, I might be a little more yeah. cynical than you. I like your positive outlook, but yeah. <laughs> If, it, it, I just yeah. have a feeling what, the money will your, just um, be diverted elsewhere. But I hope that we can use the resources and, and give students more opportunity. But you're right that the university is about being yeah. social and, and coming together. And you learn differently uh, when you're in person, regardless of the, certainly for with a practical thing like piano, um, a hands-on thing. You, you mm -hmm. just learn so much in person that it's hard to replicate online. So I, I hope we can. It is. Um, not lose some of that or, or have a, a good balance between the two. I, I think so too. I mean, um, I mean, of course that's, <laughs> I, I earn a li my living as a professor. So of course I don't want that to happen, but uh, you know, because um, it's something first I love to, to do these in-person things, but I, I think we all smell that something is changing, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. and, and also with all of these orchestras that have folded this year, Mm -hmm. um, it's harder and harder to sell some of these really expensive degrees to people if yeah. there's no um, job waiting for them at the end. Yeah, and that, and that to me is is a real tragedy of what has happened. Is I, I and I don't and I don't see I don't know how. I'm hopeful. Um, I, I I like you. I'm, I'm pretty positive about the future. But I I the orchestra thing the the community orchestras, the, the, the even midsize, um, you know, uh, city orchestras, uh, you know, a lot of them have closed down and, and I don't mm -hmm. see a way back. And, you know, uh, is that, that's going to be a difficult challenge, I think. Mm. Yeah. I would it hope that be. some, and I, oh, I think sorry. No, I'm getting no, some please, lags. Go no, no, you go, you go. I, I'll say oh. my ideas. I have some lag on my end, I think. No, I, I just I just was agreeing with what what he was saying. Um, go ahead, Elias. 
Well, I was saying, I think a lot of uh, uh, a lot of small groups or whatever will hopefully fill those gaps uh, from from the vacuum that's left. But I'm also hoping that maybe our our culture shifts so that it's not about um, yeah, of course, the tuition I think in this country is is a huge pen, uh, epidemic, but but not that okay, you're you're going to pay all this money so that you get a great job in the end, and that's sort of guaranteed. But maybe it's it's okay to say you know, we we can support this kind of thing in our culture just because it's good to have it, and uh, maybe this musician will go into another field, or or there will be a, a an orchestra waiting at the end that doesn't pay as well or that's subsidized somehow. But that's okay. You can. You can still earn a living and, and have a living wage um, and, and have spent your time pursuing something that's not, you know, directly uh, helping or, or making money. You know, I, I think we just put so much uh, emphasis in this in this country on STEM stuff. And, and it's wonderful and it's right. necessary. But just to say, OK, you know, if, if you're not in one of those uh, fields and even if you are in one of those fields, you can have a little bit more time to be creative and not just the, the workaholic sure. thing. And, and I think we're starting to see some of those uh, those things that have been put in place for so long. I mean, since kind of unions got us those 40 hour work weeks, that stuff has been challenged. And um, there's some success. There's some evidence that shows success in, in challenging those norms. And maybe in the music world, we can also, you know, challenge those uh, those notions. That we can pursue this, and it can be beneficial to everybody. And we don't have to have uh, a great job. We can go into other related fields where our training in music really helped us out. Um, I'm yeah, hoping for that. Let also, yeah. Let me also mention one other thing. I think, and this goes kind of goes back to to earlier in our discussion. You know, the importance of of having a relationship with the audience is because that audience may indeed hold members that can help contribute to, um, you know, the, a rebuilding. Because I really think that that um, a live orchestra, live performances, live piano solo um, performances, um, all of these rock performance, I mean, all of these things, um, you know, took such a huge hit and, and is, is, I think a lot of people actually do and have missed it. Mm -hmm. and i'm and i'm hopeful one of my hopes is, is that you know that that the the eyes grew fonder as it was away from us and we can mm -hmm. you know the heart grew fonder and we can we can actually you know get back and and really embrace the arts and 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 some you know entrepreneur who makes a, a you know million with the next facebook can can start up a you know a, a, the next orchestra you know in other words the, the, the idea of passing the arts along, passing the, these ideas along so that so that it can continue, I think it's is important for an artist to be a, a major part of. You're right. And, you know, I, I really love what you guys are saying, um, that it doesn't necessarily have to be about the end, the end goal of like, OK, there's a job waiting for you or something. Like, it could be this, you know, you studied music and because of that, you became a deeper person and that led you to be you know the person you are and I, I love that and I, I agree with that and you know it kind of reminds me of Steve Jobs you know Steve Jobs studied um, what's that school in Portland uh, he studied oh, the, there for a year uh, sound or arts um, uh, um, um, I'm no I'm uh, I it doesn't I, I'll think about it but anyway he studied calligraphy yeah, there oh, and, awesome. he, he took a lot of um, you know calligraphy classes and wow. you know he loved he loved that for some reason. And mm -hmm. is he ever gonna? Is that practical? No. <laughs> but what happens is that attention to detail, and right. all of that manifests itself into Apple twenty or thirty twenty years later, or I don't know, fifteen years later. And so like, and he keeps on talking about you know that class as being this really important thing for him. So kind of what you guys were saying, and I, I love that idea, is that it just, you never know how these art, the arts are going to affect your, your future person. Just like Steve Jobs never imagined that he would be doing this stuff with computers and he would reference back these, this very detailed mind in calligraphy, you know? Um, so it's, I think that's what the arts, that's what they do. It's just hard to I, measure I think that. I mean, yeah. 
Well, but yeah. you know what? But in some ways it is, but in some ways I, you made the point in a previous uh, podcast, Elias, uh, the, the old Winston Churchill saying of, you mm-hmm. know, why are we, you know, why, why are, are we fighting, fighting if it, if it isn't for our culture and for our arts, you know, that that's the, 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 it, it may be hard to quantify in, in, in dollars and cents, but you know, when it comes yeah. to the human heart, it's like, a, it's, it's a, uh, you know, I hate to put a religious aspect to it, but in some way, they, those two, the art and religion, I think, meld together very well from a standpoint that it can change the human heart and it can help us communicate very human things um, that if we lose um, is, is makes our culture worse in a in an astronomical way. Mm, yeah. yeah. Or it's like, what is the rest yeah. for? And, and I think there's also, I mean, we can always look at evidence of those students that ha- had music education early on do better in the STEM fields. You know, they become better mathematicians and they're oh, for sure. more focused. And, and all mm. that is, is wonderful. Um, and I think even there's some statistics or some data out now that, that show a lot of med schools and law schools are hiring more uh, art students or specifically music students. And, you know, that's that's mm. not really surprising to me. And others might say, well, they should already have a bachelor's in, you know, in science. But more and more they're coming from the arts to those fields, whether or not they're being pushed by by monetary gains or just their their minds, the way they've studied has has been affected. And I think that's that's part of it. So my, my original point is um, a lot of music affects the these other fields. And while that's wonderful, I want to come back to. Uh, music is good just for its own sake, you know, and it's it's important just mm. for maybe the humanity side and not to be too cliche, but, you know, that's that's what we're trying to achieve. So uh, when I teach students, yeah, maybe none of them are going to become concert pianists, and that's fine. Uh, and it's going to help them in their math or in their science or in their history. But I also want them to sort of appreciate it on its own merits. Uh, so that music is, is just mm. as good as all of those. It's not just a vehicle or, or a conduit to those. So. Mm. All right, I really like that. That's a that's a great yeah. point of view. I, I think so. I think so. It's Maybe great. it's too uh, too not 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 privileged, but like too utopic, you know, or or ideal. <laughs> Maybe too ideal, but I think it's it's something to strive for. Anyway, well, I think I, I think there's a, it, and 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 I'm going to butcher the story. So it's a total paraphrase of the story. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we're here. We can edit. <laughs> of the story. That's right. Well, but but uh, my understanding is is the, um, you know, one of the head scientists of um, the Human Genome Project, you know, was actually homeschooled. And they asked him, like, well, what did your, you know, what did your parents teach you to get you ready to for all this science and all, all of this and all of that? And he's like, my, my parents were hippies. You know, we studied Shakespeare and played the violin all day. Like, what are you talking oh, about? And then, yeah. and they said, well, when did you start getting into science? And it wasn't until he was a teenager when he started learning. But the thing is, he learned about passion. And he learned how to think and he learned certain things that allowed him that when hit, when that spark hit, that hit his passion, he was able to harness that into a, a new and interesting way that really revolutionized science and revolutionized the world. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, you, I don't think that happens without art. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. I agree. Yeah. It's something about, um, it gets at, of course, I mean, it gets at a different part of the brain. We, we know that, but the other thing about art is that, uh, for people to play well, there's this diligence, there's this yes. grit that we all have to go through. And grit. if you apply that grit to other aspects, no matter what it is, science, you will succeed. Boom, and, boom. and it's really just this, um, I mean, of course, there's, I mean, there's a whole other thing of what is talent and can talent be learned and <laughs> is there natural <laughs> talent? Who knows? But mostly it's about your your daily investigation your grit you're waking up every day and you it may not be pleasurable <laughs> but you're going to do it again and then you're going to do it again it's like the process of doing this and music teaches you to do that you know yeah. um and so i think no matter what it's this really valuable life skill but i love also what you guys are talking about that it's not just like for something else it's the thing itself 
that you <laughs> study just for the sake of, you know, someone put it this way. It's like music is handmade. And it really is true. Like we don't need to press play on an MP3 player. It's like we're making the sound. And something about that, you know, actually the tactile sensation is really enjoyable, you mm -hmm. know. And if I want to make this faster, I can. If I want to play that because I'm playing it, you know. There's something yeah. really basic and simple and, and beautiful about that, you know. Yeah, the road to Hana is, I remember is when the first. Part. That's the point. Yes. Sorry, go ahead, Mike. The road to honor. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I remember first playing the piano, and it, it, you know, I was a young, young kid, but it just amazed me that I could, you know, press this button, press this key, and the sound would make, and I could manipulate it, and I could do different things, and it was, it was really just, you know, kind of magic to be able to do that. Um, you know, that's as a young kid, and, and you know, it's, it's um, it, I'd love to re-enchant <laughs> the, the society, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we become so disenchanted on so many levels. It'd be great to re-enchant ourselves a little bit. Oh, mm. yes. I like that idea. Yeah. <laughs> well, cool. So, um, so okay, you go. I, I don't know. There are so many other things we can or subjects we can talk about, but uh, I don't know if you want to go into a different direction, Tom or, or Mike, if you had some thoughts. I know you and I had discussed a few things uh, the other day. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, you know, we talked, we talked about, you know, the, the coming back of live performances. We talked about, you know, mm -hmm. older and newer, newer music. Um, what, so you're, you're preparing, let me ask you, kind of go back to your, your Ives piece that you're preparing. Mm -hmm. um, as, as, imagine somebody's coming to this piece and going to hear it for the first time. What, Tom, would you want them to know, or would you want them to hear previous recording? Like, what, as an audience member, what would you want their, if any, preparation to be? Well, I wouldn't want them to have to do homework, you know. I, because you know, <laughs> I, I don't want them to, I don't want them to give, I don't want to give them the wrong impression. But the biggest thing I would want to try to convey is that this music is not going to unfold like Beethoven. So, in other words, you, it, and it's not trying to be like Beethoven. It's he's trying to be like himself. So try hard to listen to it in a different way. Just like if you're, you know, if you go to a restaurant and you taste something for the first time, you're not expecting this to taste like something else. You know, it's a different cuisine, and so it has different flavors, different spices, and um, at first it may be difficult to sort of taste all these new things, but. It's just to try to remain, keep your ears open, you know, and uh, give it the benefit of the doubt. There's, there may be places where, you know, you may not be into what's going on, but give it a chance because it, it may surprise you. There's something about uh, focusing on just something and trying to really listen to it without distractions. I guess that would be the other thing I would try to say in, a, in not a... Um, I mean, in a, a positive way, is like try not to look at your iPhone. You know, try to just mm -hmm. listen to the music and try to, um, you be, know, understand what the composer might be. It, yeah, be present, and um, that's something that's I lot, we all can do. That is hard. Yeah. That's very yeah. hard. It's um, hard. You yeah. know, I, 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 you know, I remember as a kid, um, you know, laying down on the floor in my bedroom with speakers at my feet, you know, turning on different pieces and turning on different songs and listening to them over and over and over. And I would do that for hours and hours. And, and, and it wasn't just me. I'm not saying that because I'm a musician, like my friends, we did that as, you know, we did that. That's part of like what we, what you did. We went outside and played baseball and then we came in and listened <laughs> to music for three hours, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, cool. and that has, I think, gone so like we don't have that anymore so the ability just the ability to sit down and and really take in and as you said be present for for a live performance is is really important i think yeah. you know i I, um, I find I recently so read a book oh, that sorry. has been really meaningful yeah. go, ahead, go, go ahead, ahead. My, my lag my lag is really no, no go ahead Tom. You, you go ahead yeah, Tom. go ahead Tom. Yeah. Oh, okay no no worries so i just just really short just really quickly i you know i just finished reading this book by this guy Cal Newport called um, Deep Think. 
And it just talks about this idea in our society how, you know, we're constantly looking back at our email or looking at, you know, social media. And that's really been harmful for our brains because if we're, if I'm practicing for two hours, you know, something intensely, I need to let my brain relax afterwards to digest mm -hmm. that. I don't need to go and look at my computer, which is another kind of stimulation. So like mm -hmm. that is just a simple change of like being able to let your brain digest what you just did. And, but it makes it, it makes a big difference. And I've found that ever since I started doing that, like last month, I'm, I'm much more happy now. <laughs> I'm much happier because I'm not like, um, <laughs> modern society guy constantly like going back and forth between email, social media, piano, you know, it's just a little brains. I don't think we're ever, at least now, I mean, I, I don't think we're able to, to do all those quick jumps as, as much as we may think we are. What does that look like for you? Like, mm -hmm. so when you practice, you'll like just keep the phone off for a couple of more hours or you, what does that practically look like for you? I mean, the book talks about this and I, I've been really inspired by it, but basically normally, um, and I hope I can do this during the year, but normally sure. I'll practice. And then, you know, there's a, there's a mountain of emails that I need to start to get on. But instead of doing that, I'll go outside and clear my brain by just taking a walk. And then I'll designate the last hour of the day for emails as opposed to, you know, doing it after every, you know, free 10 minutes. See, because the brain is, is constantly, you know, working on all these different things. And I think it's just like oversaturation. So um, mm -hmm. that's one of the things that I think has made a, a real big change in my life. And so I'd recommend that book to anyone, you know. Deep, deep think is that what it was it's called? called? Yeah. yeah. Excuse me. Deep work. Deep, deep work. work. Oh, deep work. Right. Okay. Cal Newport. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great book. Really meaningful. Fantastic. Yeah. I, well, I was going to um, maybe go in a slightly, if we have a couple minutes, uh, direction with the Ives particularly, uh, because I know, you know, you talked about uh, explaining a little bit and you don't want the audience to do homework per se, but it's such a, an evocative work. And I like that it's very, uh, ex certain parts are very accessible. You know, when he, when he, um, I don't want to give too much away, but, and, and I don't want you to, mm. if you're preparing this big um, presentation, but, you know, the references to Beethoven's fifth and, and Chopin with uh, fantasy impromptu, but, and even bringing in other musicians, I don't know if you're doing mm. that kind of performance uh, or using block, you know, I'd be curious if you could talk about some of the, oddities of that piece um just you know mention them briefly so that people that yeah. obviously can't hear it now will just be interested like oh that i i should listen to that and open my mind up to it so yeah so one of the so what he tries to do is give a kind of a personal metaphor for each uh per each person so the first movement is emerson and he saw emerson as this really wonderful preacher that would go off on tangents, kind of like this podcast, you know, yeah. in a wonderful way. I, I mean that in the most wonderful way, right? And then what would happen, and, you know, people listening to Emerson's sermon, they knew that eventually he would come to some really profound idea. Hmm. And they would wait for that, and it would, and they would anticipate it, but they had to be willing to like go in the weeds with him for a little bit because eventually mm -hmm. he would come out to that. So the music mm -hmm. really unfolds like that, at least the first movement. And the other weird thing about the Concord Sonata is that there's optional one line in the first, in the first movement where you can have an optional viola part. And the <laughs> viola part is only like five or five bars. Or yeah. it's like one line of music. So like the violist waits for 15 <laughs> minutes in the first movement and then makes an appearance and plays five bars. Okay. <laughs> and, super weird, but like, that's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> and then yeah. at the end of the sonata, the last, um, the movement's called Thoreau, which is named for, you know, Henry David Thoreau, right. who lived uh, two years on Walden and, you know, built his own house and wanted to commune with nature. And it was also known that David, that he loved to play the flute, you know, and that's kind of how he occupied 
some of his time there in solitude on Lake Wal the small Lake Walden. Anyway, at the end of Thoreau, there's an optional flute part, and it's sort of you know Ives very poetically kind of brings it back. Um, now, if you know that about Thoreau, that's that's bonus. But I think it's just it's beautiful because that theme that's played by the flute is actually a theme that's been played the entire sonata. So it's like mm. finally being brought back 45 minutes later. And um, it has a, it, it just a really eerie kind of sense of the, the piece ending. And so mm -hmm. that's like a really interesting thing about it. But then also what's weird and interesting is all of a sudden at some of these places, the the piece will stop and then all of a sudden there'll be like a fanfare or there'll be like a patriotic mm -hmm. song you know mm -hmm. that you would hear at the 4th of July mm -hmm. and it'll just be super bombastic and literally out of nowhere and then that will kind of explode and then all of a sudden out of nowhere there'll be like a church hymn that's like the most calm thing so it's like really an emotional roller coaster in the biggest way so i mean wow. shortly ives just tries to give his own impression of these authors you know and mm -hmm. then the third one is called the alcott's which is a it's kind of metaphor for louisa may alcott who wrote yeah little women and and mm -hmm. he imagines her improvising off of beethoven's fifth symphony so she's kind of uh, you know it so it's depicting like you know simple life in new england in the 1800s and you know um life before the internet, life before <laughs> radio, life before cars, this yeah. idea that you're living off the land and those kinds of things. So in summary, that's kind of what it is, but it, it's really much more than that, you know? Uh, well, I think people well, will want to hear the piece now. Yeah. I, I think so. so. Yeah. <laughs> You've <laughs> evangelized uh, Ives very well. Yeah. Um, you know what? I think I think we're probably about time. I've I've honestly I've got to turn on the air conditioner in here in my studio. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. So, um, but I want to sincerely and with much gratitude thank you, Tom, for taking your time oh, with us and, and sharing your 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 love, sharing your wisdom, sharing just your you being you with us. It, it, it's made the show better. And, and we enjoy having you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's always a pleasure, yeah. guys. Thanks. It's really my pleasure. And um, you guys take care. And I hope you guys yeah. are, are not frying over there in, the, <laughs> in that area of the world. Uh, not yet. Not yet. <laughs> but, <laughs> but thank you, Tom. This yeah. has been Tom Rosencrantz and Elias Axel Pedersen. My name is Mike Levitt, and you've been listening to And If Love Remains.